السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ ڈاکٹر اسرار احمد از اے ورلڈ رینون اسکالر اینڈ تھنکر آن اسلام ہی از آلسو اے ویری فائن اوریٹر اسپیشلی ان دی اردو لینگویج ہی واز بورن ان نائنٹین تھرٹی ٹو ان ہریانہ اسٹیٹ آف انڈیا ان اے ٹاؤن Since 1970, Dr. Israr Ahmed left his medical practice and has since been devoting his life entirely to the study and teaching of the Holy Quran. Dr. Israr Ahmed believes in a totally revolutionary concept of Islam and in this he has been greatly influenced by Allama Iqbal, Maulana Abul Kalam Azad and Maulana Abul Ala Maududi. In 1972, He founded the Markaz-e Anjuman Khuddam al-Quran to disseminate and propagate the knowledge of the Holy Quran. In 1975, he founded the Tanzim-e Islami for establishing deen through a totally revolutionary process following the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. On behalf of his well-wishers, the Islamic Research Foundation as well as our viewers, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Israr Ahmed to our studio in Mumbai for an interview. Thank you. Dr. Saab, what inspired you to leave medical practice and take up dawah as a full-time profession? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Actually, I never say that I took the decision of leaving my medical profession and adopting the whole time service to Islam and Quran. Firstly, at a very young age, somehow I was possessed by the beauty of Quran. I say I was possessed. So I started learning Quran and then sharing with others whatever I learned as a student of medical college in the very early years, first and second years of my education. In the third year of that MBBS course, I had decided consciously that the profession now will remain secondary with me. And my first duty is towards Allah and His Deen and His Book. So I became an activist. And I am of the habit that whatever I adopt, I adopt fully, not partially. So I became Nazi Mihala of Islamic Jamiyat al Pakistan at a time when both West and East Pakistan were together. Then after the completion of my education, because I had already decided that this is going to be secondary with me, I didn't pursue further education, or specialization, etc., and postgraduate education. I started practice. And disseminating the teachings of Quran and especially the philosophy which Quran calls the Hikmah, the Hikmah of Quran. And now this thing increased and increased and increased so that it ate into the time that I was devoting to my practice. Gradually, gradually that was knocked out and I was left alone with my service of Quran and not only of Quran but according to the teachings of the Quran and according to the demand of Quran for the struggle to establish the deen of Allah as a total politico-socio-economic system on the earth which belongs to Allah. So these are two main lines of my life. Reading Quran, understanding Quran, pondering over Quran, and then delivering lessons in Quran, lectures in, on Quran. So that is one. And the other is to organize a disciplined party of committed people who devote their lives for an Islamic revolution. You have correctly used the word revolutionary concept of deen. So these are the two parallel lines in my life. The third one, that is the medical practice was knocked out. It is now 34 years that it had gone out of my life. 
what do you think are the real prerequisites for a profitable and wise study of the Quran and where would it lead our ummah? Actually, for understanding the Quran, one has to learn Arabic. Not to be a very learned person in Arabic language, but that much Arabic which will enable him to read Quran with his own eyes without the help of any translator or interpreter. So this is the first prerequisite. Then there should be a real desire. I want to understand the word of God and a sincere decision that I will follow Quran. I will study Quran objectively, not subjectively, not forcing upon it any preconceived ideas that I have, but to follow Quran actually. Learning Quran in this way is on one side of the process. Then you should be aware of the contemporary thought and the currents of thought that are there in the world today, especially the social sciences, the philosophy, psychology, ethics, then the sociology and uh, economics and political science and so on, so that the two can be joined together so that we can preach the word of God and convey the message of God and the wisdom of Quran to the educated elite of our time. Dr. Saab, if we analyze the modern system around us tends to be more self-centered and optional, whereas the Islamic system is God-centered and obligatory. Which one is better and how? Modern man has become self-centered in the sense that he has become a slave to his animal instincts. And number two, he has concentrated his attention on the world, the material world, the world of matter, while Quran the word of God wants us to be self-centered, but the self, the higher self, the ego, the khudi, the ana, just as the Upanishads, one, you know, verse of the Upanishads, translated into English is, man in his ignorance identifies himself with the material sheets which encompass his real self. So this is the ignorance of man, that he thinks that this is myself, this body and its needs and its pleasures. And he just forgets that his real self is within that. This is actually what the Quran has said. Don't become like those who forgot Allah. So. Allah made them forgetful of their own selves. Now the self here doesn't mean body and its requirements. Nobody is oblivious of his body and his requirements. But the inner self, the khudi, which according to the Quran is the ruh and the spirit has a direct contact with God. It has come from God and it will return to God. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi The next point we would like to have our viewers understand is today worldwide Muslims are being manipulated and subjugated by the anti-Islamic forces. The question which arises in a regular layman's mind is, is it a test from Allah or is it a punishment from Allah? And uh, those who are under such manipulation or subjugation, what can other Muslim brothers do to help them? Actually, I somewhat differ from what you have said. This subjugation of the Muslims is about 300, 400 years long. When Islam and Muslims were washed away from the Iberian Peninsula, Spain, from then started the colonial flood coming to the whole Muslim world. So actually subjugation 
از اے لانگ پروسیس سب جوگیشن آف دی مسلمس ایٹ دیٹ ٹائم دے ور ناٹ اگینسٹ اسلام اسلام ایز ریلیجن دے نیور آبجیکٹیڈ ٹو ایٹ اینڈ ایون ٹو ڈے دے ڈونٹ اپوز اسلام ایز ریلیجن تھری تھنگس گو ٹو میک ریلیجن سم بلیفس سم ڈاگما وی کال عقیدہ دین سم موڈس آف ورشپ سم ریچولس اینڈ رائٹس سوشل کسٹمس سو دیز تھری تھنگس گو ٹو میک ریلیجن اینڈ دی ویسٹ واز نیور اگینسٹ دس پارٹ آف اسلام اینڈ اسٹل ٹو ڈے اٹ از ناٹ اگینسٹ دس پارٹ آف اسلام اینڈ وین دے سے اسپیشلی وین بش سیز دیٹ وی آر ناٹ اگینسٹ اسلام وی آر ناٹ ویجنگ اے وار اگینسٹ اسلام دے آر ٹرو بیکاز دے آر ناٹ اگینسٹ دس کانسیپٹ آف اسلام دے آر ریڈی ٹو ایمبریس اٹ دے کین سے اینڈ سے اے ٹروتھ فلی دیٹ یو مسلمس کیم اوور ٹو امریکہ یونائٹیڈ اسٹیٹس یو پرچیز چرچز اینڈ سنیگاگس کنورٹیڈ دیم ان ٹو ماسکس ڈیڈ وی آبجیکٹ ٹو اٹ یو آر سینگ پریئرس ہیئر فاسٹنگ ہیو وی ایور آبجیکٹیڈ رادر وی انوائٹ یو ٹو افطار پارٹی ان ڈیورنگ رمضان ٹو دی وائٹ ہاؤس اینڈ وی ایشو کومیٹیو اسٹیمپس on your festivals of Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fitr. So this Islam is not objected to. But the Islam as a political, socio-economic system, in addition to being a religion, it's a system of life, comprising all the three aspects of collective life of human beings, the political, the social, the economic. Now this they cannot tolerate. They are against it. And they want to crush The urge among the Muslims today, which is quite prevalent, that they want to establish their own system. They have their own political system. They have their own economic system. Interest is, has to be abolished totally. And gambling has to be abolished totally. And sovereignty is, belongs to God and not to people. And there can be made no legislation. which is repugnant to the book of God and the practice of his messenger. And we have a social system of ours where there is segregation of sexes, no intermixing, no free intermixing. Then we have the rules of covering the body, etc., etc., etc. So we should establish our own system. And this is what the West thinks is the biggest challenge to it. And they can't tolerate it. Dr. Saab, in this concept of this uh, political, social and economic systems you speak, could you explain to us communism and capitalism in perspectives, their claims, their reality and the ill effects on our society? And we as Muslims, how can we overcome them? Capitalism in itself is not wrong. what we call sarmaya kari to invest your capital in business industry is something which is required so that it comes into circulation and it becomes beneficial for the society but compounded with the interest in gambling and speculation etc etc it becomes a monster it divides the society between the haves and the have nots a gap big gap So actually, that is the evil part of it. Communism, on the other hand, was the antithesis to this capitalism. So that they not only did away with interest and usury, they did away with the whole concept of personal ownership. And with the personal ownership, they added a political system which was very repressive. You don't have any right to express yourself. You don't have any right for, of association, of forming and founding organizations and parties, etc., etc. Keep dumb. Work. Get the wages. You can eat, you can drink, and you can be comfortable in your lives. But this political suppression, there was a revolt against it. And that is why. And because you know 
due to the abolition of personal ownership, the incentive to work more was gone. Why should I work more? When if I earn more, it's not going to me, it will go to the state. I will get the same wage, so why should I work more? And that is why the economy of the USSR went down and went down and went down. The wheat growing area of USSR was much bigger than the wheat growing area of USA. But the USA was exporting wheat and the USSR was importing it. So that was the reason of the fall of USSR. Now Islam actually joins together the good points of communism and the good points of capitalism. Islam allows capitalism. You go and work. It gives you the incentive to work more. Because if you earn more, you will own more. Only if you have passed a certain line. Now you have to give the welfare tax, the zakah. So this becomes socialism. That now the synthesis of capitalism and socialism will take place in the form of Islam. An Islamic system, economic system is a must. Humanity is going towards it because the social justice, especially the economic justice among people, cannot be achieved. The West has achieved capitalism at the cost of equality. There is freedom, but at the cost of equality. And communism was, so to say, equality, but at the cost of freedom. So to join together, there must be freedom also and equality also. So this is actually the main theme of the Islamic economic system. Dr. Saab, how can the existing dichotomy between the modern physical and social sciences on the one hand and the knowledge revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the other hand be reconciled? It needs the establishment of universities in all the Muslim lands and numerous universities whose central department will be that of Arabic language and, and Quranic teachings. But attached to that will be the departments of social sciences and physical sciences. Now the student who enters, he wants to study economics, but he will have to read Arabic and Quran. That will be imperative for anybody who enters this university. And then he can study philosophy so that he can compare the philosophical ideas and theories of the world with what Quran has to give in this field. So in the same way, you have to dive deep into the meanings of Quran and then study this economics also. So you will be able to understand and appreciate what light Quran throws and what are the wisdoms behind the abolition of riba, what is the wisdom behind the abolition of, of gambling, etc., etc. So, and that will be with a, an intellectual dimension. You understand, you don't only accept Islam, you understand it. The hikmah, the wisdom behind these injunctions of Quran become clear to you. So, unless such universities are established in Muslim countries, this dichotomy cannot be removed. Dr. Saab, finally, what would be your message priority-wise in the current context for Muslims, especially for Muslims in the Indian context? I think Islam is one throughout the world. There are no two Islams. Islam of India and Islam of Pakistan and Islam of Turkey and Islam of Bangladesh. No. Islam is one. So, the same two lines which I have adopted. There's a hadith which says the Prophet has been reported to have said, لا يمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه. Nobody amongst you can be a true believer, true mu'min, unless he likes for his brother the same thing which he likes for himself. So whatever I have chosen for myself, Actually, I suggest and propose to every other Muslim. These two things should go side by side. Teaching and propagating the word of God.
and the message, and not only message, the wisdom of Quran, the hikmah. You all know Muhammad Kitab of Al-Hikmah. The Prophet taught them not only the book but also the wisdom. So, on the one side, this process should go on. On the other side, to organize a party, a revolutionary party, to establish the system of social justice that has been given by God, because the system given by Allah, the Creator of all. Only that system can be just. Otherwise, the human beings, if they devise a system, it has to be biased. If a woman is thinking, she knows her feelings and her psychology, but she cannot appreciate the feelings of the men and their psychology. So they will devise some system which is pro-women, and men will devise a system which is pro-men. They can't find, you know, the point of justice between the two. Only God, who has created the males and females both, He can give the system, which is just for men and for the women. There are the employers, the capitalists, the owners of the mills and factories. There is labor. What should be the division of the profits? How much should go to the laborers? How much should go to the capitalists? Who will decide it? Capitalists will always think for himself. And the laborer has to think about himself. So Allah, for whom, as the hadith goes to say, Al Khalq wa Yalullah, all creatures are like a family to God, to Allah. So only He can devise what should be the balance between the capital and the labor. How to share the profits? In the same way, people who are at the helm of affairs, who are ruling, they want more and more power, more and more power, more and more power. So that it leads to maybe a totalitarian state or a semi-totalitarian state, and people want freedom and freedom and freedom and freedom. So what should be the balance? This can be given by God only. So to establish the system of social justice given by Allah through His last messenger and prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the best for the whole of mankind. So, to do good to the human, you know, race as a whole, we have to establish that system in at least some one sizable country to be able to show to the world that these are the benefits of this system. Come and see with your own eyes. To strive for these two objectives is imperative on every Muslim, whether every Mormon at least, not if not Muslim, a true believer. Whether he is living in India or Pakistan. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Israr Ahmed Saab, for sharing your insight and wisdom on Islam in the current context with our viewers. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Silence.